What's going on, you guys? Welcome back to the Neighborhood Podcast. One of the hosts of the podcast, my name is Kyle Dabra. Good, everybody. Other half of the podcast, Kevin Valentin here. Man, the playoffs is here. We couldn't be happier. Kyle, are you ready to dive into this agenda, brother? Yes, sir. We got some NFL divisional round matchups to go over. We got some good ones to go over. So this is definitely going to be a fun episode, but let's not waste any more time. Let's dive into these matchups. Um, we got four matchups, like we stated. Uh, the first one we're going to go over is going to be the Bengals and Titans matchup. Really, the main focus on that one is going to be just the fact that the Bengals have been surging the last month or so. They're carrying that hot streak against the number one seeded Titans. The Titans are getting Derrick Henry back for this game, so it's going to be set up for an epic battle between the number one seeded Titans and the surging Bengals. After that, we'll talk about the 49ers and the Packers matchup. The 49ers, kind of similar to the Bengals, they've been kind of on their own respective hot streak as well. They upset the Dallas Cowboys on the road last week in the NFC wild card round. They will be going up against the number one seeded Green Bay Packers. There's a lot of pressure on Green Bay in this game, specifically on Aaron Rodgers, just because that playoff success definitely comes into question when we get into this part of the year with Aaron Rodgers and the Packers. So that'll definitely be a fun topic of discussion. After that, we got the Rams and the Buccaneers matchup. Matt Stafford and the boys are coming off of a pretty solid win against the Arizona Cardinals last week in the NFC Wild Card round. And then to kick it to the Tampa side of things, the Bucks looked pretty impressive against the Philadelphia Eagles last week in the NFC Wild Card round. So this is really a good matchup of two evenly matched teams in the Rams and the Buccaneers. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the quarterback duel that we have between Matt Stafford and Tom Brady. So that'll definitely be a fun topic of discussion when we get to it. After that will be the last NFL divisional round matchup, which is going to feature a rematch of last year's AFC championship game between the Buffalo Bills and the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, the Bills are coming off of a epic smackdown of the New England Patriots last week. And in similar fashion, the Chiefs are coming off of a pretty sizable sizable beatdown against the Pittsburgh Steelers last week in the AFC wildcard round. So this will be a great matchup that will round out our NFL topics for the day. And then we will have one NBA topic to go over, and that is going to be Nikola Jokic. Nikola Jokic is having, once again, a stellar MVP caliber season. He's coming off of, of, of a performance where he had, I believe, 49 points, 14 rebounds, and 10 assists in a staggering triple-double in an overtime thriller against the... Who were they playing, Kevin, that night? I, I don't even know. I'm actually looking at it right now. I think it was, the, it was the Clippers. It was the Clippers. Okay, against the Clippers. So we'll dive into that a little bit more dive into that a little bit more in depth and we're going to focus on the question of is Nikola Jokic arguably the best player in the NBA at this current moment in time so that'll definitely be a good topic to round out the episode limited it to five topics today so you know this should definitely be a fun episode hope you guys enjoy it but let's not waste any more time let's dive into these NFL matchups the first one being the Cincinnati Bengals going up against the Tennessee Titans. So to kind of give a quick preview of this matchup, we got the Cincinnati Bengals going up against the number one seeded Tennessee Titans. The Bengals were the only team that played last week in this matchup. The Bengals are coming off of a wild card win over the Las Vegas Raiders. They won by the score of 26 to 19. Joe Burrow in his first playoff game in his NFL career looks pretty solid, looks pretty poised in that matchup against the Raiders. Defensively, they did give up some points at the end of that matchup, but they were able to get the game ceiling interception off of Derek Carr that propelled them to this divisional matchup against the Titans. The Titans are the number one seeded team in the AFC. They finished off the year with the best record in the AFC, despite not having Derek Henry in the lineup for the last two months of the season. And Derrick Henry's impact is going to loom large in this matchup because he is scheduled to play in this matchup. He, 
we don't know what sort of impact that he will provide, but when Derrick Henry is in the lineup, he's definitely going to be the focal piece of whatever the Tennessee offense is going to provide in this matchup against the Bengals, potentially. But really, let's focus on the question here. Kevin, to kick this one to you, do you think that Derrick Henry can slow down this surging Bengals team of late? So um, I'm... I'm confused with this one only because we don't know the capacity that Derek is going to be back. I know he was activated. I know they're saying that he's got a full clear path in terms of like, you know, not really much of a pitch count, but are we going to get the Derek Henry of old back? Are we going to get the 2000 yard season Derek Henry? Are we going to get the guy that's bolstering people over with his overpowering strength and size and then breakaway speed? We quite frankly do not know. Um, that injury could end up setting Derrick Henry back. It could end up slowing him down. He could have playoff jitters. There's a million different narratives that could end up happening uh, with, with Derrick Henry. The biggest thing is, even if Derrick Henry doesn't come back to be 100%, if it's 85%, that is still a consistent, powerful running back that is going to take away the clock, take away time of possession from Joe Burrow in that offense. And quite frankly, I don't know if the Bengals have necessarily been able to face someone of Derek's caliber. Um, so I'm just kind of looking at this and I'm saying, if Derek Henry can just play consistent, just four yards per carry, 20 to 25 touches, you know, maybe get a couple of catches in the passing game here and there, that is going to bode tremendously for Tennessee because we all know that Ryan Tannehill has his best performances when the play action pass is working. And what better way to test that when you have arguably one of the most dominant running backs in the NFL coming back in a postseason game? Now, obviously, Tennessee has some postseason history, a little bit of experience uh, from last year's big run. So uh, they're no stranger to this particular instance. They're no stranger to this pressure. On the opposing side, Cincinnati Bengals are young. They're very inexperienced in the playoffs. Um, Joe Burrow and those boys are definitely probably the hottest team in football right now. I believe I looked at a statistic that said Joe Burrow had over 1,000 yards passing, 13 total touchdowns, and I believe zero interceptions in his last five games, which of course include this past postseason game. That's massive. Usually the hottest team in the league typically has the best performance in the playoffs, and in this case it just ha so happens to be the most inexperienced team in the playoffs that's remaining. So – I'm looking at the Bengals and I'm saying they got to limit turnovers. Joe Burrow has to have a flawless game. Um, Joe has to be able to distribute the ball evenly. It can't just be Jamar Jamar, that three-headed monster of Higgins, uh, Boyd, and, of course, um, Jamar has to be effective and consistent. I think they're also going to have to utilize Joe Mixon to keep away from Derrick Henry himself because once the Titans get rolling, once Derrick gets comfortable, once he gets in a rhythm, it is hard to slow that offense down. Those drives are going to start to become from six to eight minute drives. You could end up being nine to 12 minutes. I mean, we've seen the Titans drain the clock tremendously when Derrick Henry is in the game and healthy. So we will end up seeing what happens. Be about 36 degrees out there in Tennessee. Obviously, home field advantage belongs to the Titans. So we'll see how Joe can handle the adversity of being in an opponent's house. Um, for his first away postseason game. But if I had to put a pin on it, if I had to actually go out there and make a guess or a prediction, I'm saying the Bengals are going to win this game. I got the Bengals going to the Super Bowl. I know that's a bold statement. I know that's something crazy. I know that we're a couple of games away from that. But there's just something about Joe Burrow I can't shake. There's something about the Bengals that I really like. And if I'm completely wrong, I'm completely wrong. It doesn't really matter. Kyle and I have been wrong on so many takes this year. But – I just really have faith in the Bengals to advance to the AFC Championship because I think that that three-headed receiving core of a monster and Joe Mixon combined is going to be a tall task for the Titans to stop. Yeah, and I'm going to take the totally opposite route that you have in this matchup. So when I look at the Titans as a whole, this matchup really screams to me, similar to what you said, how effective is Derrick Henry going to be? And I think he's going to loom large as far as his overall impact. I think that Derek has been really waiting for this moment. I think it I think it killed him not to be out there with his teammates the last two months while he was recovering from this injury that he had about halfway through the season. Now that he's back in the lineup for Tennessee, I think it's going to bode tremendously well for their overall psyche going into this game because, let's face it, Tennessee is 
a relatively good football team without Derrick Henry. I wouldn't know if, if they would be the best team in the AFC, but the fact of the matter is, is that his impact was so great through the first half of the season that he was still like a top three, top four running back in yards, in total yards, excuse me, basically until the end of the season, which really just goes to show just how amazing that his impact for Tennessee is because he's such a huge force for that team that despite being out half of the season, they were able to carry the momentum from what he was able to establish the first half of the year and not having him in the second half, they were still able to claim that number one spot in the AFC. So it really kind of goes to show just how effective Derek's impact can be when he's just rolling on all cylinders. And I think in this matchup, I think that there, there are some holes in this Cincinnati defense that Derrick Henry can exploit. And I think he could exploit it in a significant way. I could potentially see him possibly getting 125, even 150 yards, as long as Tennessee doesn't have him on a pitch count. It's really indicative on just, is he fully 100% going into this game? I would like to assume that he is. But if he's not, I think it will definitely limit Tennessee's impact to a certain extent. But as far as the game is concerned, I am definitely favoring the Tennessee Titans in this one over the Cincinnati Bengals. When I look at the Bengals side of things, I think the Bengals, they had a very good game against the Raiders last week at home. Getting that seven-point win was huge for Joe Burrow. And really these young guns on Cincinnati to bolster their confidence going into this matchup against Tennessee. But this is a different environment that they're going into. They're going on the road. They're going up against the best team in the AFC. And the best team in the AFC is getting Derrick Henry back. That's a tall task for a very young team, a very inexperienced team going on the road against a juggernaut like the Titans. So I think as far as my prediction goes, I do have Tennessee winning this one in a relatively close game. Like I said, I think Derrick Henry's impact is going to be significant. I could see him possibly getting like 125, 150 yards, like I said. And I think when it comes to Cincinnati, I think Joe Burrow is going to struggle in this game. I think Tennessee's defense is going to get him off of his mark, potentially force a turnover or two off of him. And I think what you saw against the Raiders last week in regards to Joe Burrow's performance, I think that was kind of a one-off. I just think that even though the Joe Burrow is a very good quarterback as the young quarterback that he is, I think he does come back down to earth. I think this hot streak that Cincinnati's been on, I think it comes to an end. But I do give them credit for really the hot streak that they've been on, but I just think it comes to an end in this matchup against Tennessee. I've got Tennessee winning this one. I'm going to say 27-21. I think it's going to be a one-possession game when it's all said and done. But I just favor Tennessee a little bit more than I do Cincinnati, despite the fact that Cincinnati has been on a hot streak the last month or so. It's just that I think Derrick Henry is going to be huge for the Titans in this one. And I think he's really the X factor and the difference maker in this game that's going to take place this weekend. It's going to be a good game for sure. Obviously, you know, we'll see what happens with, with Derrick Henry's return. We'll see if Cincinnati can stay hot. But we do have a couple of other playoff games on yep. the slate today, so we're just going to dive right into the next topic. So, Kyle, what is next? All right, so up next, we've got the 49ers against the Packers. We're going to switch gears. We're going to go over to the NFC for a little bit. Uh, this is a huge matchup for both teams. So to kind of give you guys a preview of this game, let's focus on the 49ers first. The 49ers are coming off of a huge road win. You could basically say it was an upset win. Over the Dallas Cowboys last week, they won that game by the score of 23-17. to Really, the standout was that defense and the pass rush that they were able to, to establish against what you considered that vaunted Cowboys offensive line. Holding Dallas 17 points at home was definitely an impressive note to mark. And not only that, they're taking this relatively good hot streak that they've been on the last month or so against the number one seeded Packers. There's a lot of pressure going into this game for the Packers. The Packers are coming off of a year previously that they lost to 
Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in the NFC Championship game in Lambeau Field last year. So once again, that is going to be a big point of focus going into this matchup. The Packers are at home. They're the number one seed. Can Aaron Rodgers carry this team possibly to a Super Bowl run when it's all said and done? But first things first, they're going to go up against the San Francisco 49ers, and that is no easy task for Green Bay at hand in this matchup. So, Kevin, to kick this one to you, which team has more pressure to win this game, the Packers or the 49ers? This is 100% on the Green Bay Packers. Um, narrative aside, a game aside, let's be frank. The Packers have had probably one of the best records in the last two to three seasons than any other team in the league. And at, at a consistent clip, too. I mean, 13 and three or 13 and four, whatever they were this year, and then 13 and three last year, number one seed, number one seed. It, it, we all know that they can win in the regular season, but they've been choking in the postseason. I believe they've gone to four NFC championships in the last couple of years. I don't remember the actual statistic, but of course, my brain's farting. It's just under midnight right here. Um, but they've lost all of their NFC championship matchups since their Super Bowl birth, if I'm not mistaken. So, Every single time they have great seasons, every single time they get to a certain point, they completely collapse. They completely fall apart. Now, I know that last year was a little bit more on a coaching decision between Matt LaFleur deciding to go for a field goal instead of a touchdown and all of these different things. But there is a big story behind this, and that is Aaron Rodgers' future in Green Bay. Aaron Rodgers said that he'll play this year out at the beginning of the year when he decided to report to camp. And then he decided – what well, he didn't decide. He ended up saying that this would be his last year in Green Bay. Why would Aaron Rodgers stay if they're getting bounced again, but in an even earlier round? There's so much pressure on Green Bay as an organization to win this game and get to the Super Bowl so that Aaron Rodgers can stay in Green Bay and potentially bring them back to another one. He's an MVP candidate yet again. Green Bay has the number one record in the league again. Green Bay is the number one seed in the NFC again. There is no reason why this Green Bay team cannot and should not get to a Super Bowl. Now, in regards to the game, I predict that Green Bay will win this game because of how much is riding, because of the consistency that the Green Bay Packers have provided throughout the entire season since that embarrassing loss in week one to the Saints. I think that Aaron Rodgers is just going to continue to do what they need to do. Um, 49ers are traveling across the, uh, pretty much across the entire world to come out to Green Bay, the tundra that is Lambeau. It is going to be 12 degrees, God willing, maybe a little bit colder depending on the wind chill. But we all know how playoff football goes in January in Green Bay. When it goes through Lambeau, it is going to be a complicated, difficult, and struggle of a game for anybody coming through. So I think the 49ers have a bit of an uphill battle. Uh, Jimmy Garoppolo has been battling that thumb injury. Jimmy Garoppolo now has been diagnosed with a shoulder injury as well on the injury report. Uh, we all know that Nick Bosa was in concussion protocol, but has been practicing limitedly through the week. So 49ers have a little bit of injury things to worry about on their side of the ball. But I would say I'm picking Green Bay, and I'm going to say Green Bay is probably going to win by a touchdown or so just because they're home. They got a lot to prove, and Aaron Rodgers is trying to carry this organization back to some Super Bowl performance dominance. Yeah, I, I'm in full agreement with you on this one. As far as the team that's facing the most pressure this weekend, it has to be the Packers. And to me, it's not even close. I mean, just off of last year alone, I, I think Green Bay as an organization was so let down by the fact that they had an opportunity to go to the Super Bowl last year in front of the limited capacity as far as their fans goes in that matchup against the Buccaneers. And they fell short. And Aaron Rodgers did not have that good of a game against Tampa in that NFC championship game. Now, granted, you know, last year is in the past and this year, once again, they find themselves in a very similar situation. They're the top seed of the NFC. If everything goes according to plan, the road to the Super Bowl in the NFC would go through Lambeau field. And it really is just indicative of Aaron Rodgers and these Packers players being able to rise above the pressure that's on their backs, essentially just from the performance that they had last year and being able to overcome that. And this is a very good test for them going up against the San Francisco 49ers. The 49ers do not slouch on this team. This team was able to go on the road to Dallas last week in the NFC wildcard. And 
in my opinion, they shocked the world. I think some people were always kind of of the mindset that the, the Cowboys could choke that game away. And in that fashion, they did. I was in the mindset that the Cowboys were going to win that game. But to give the 49ers credit, they were able to go on the road, have a great performance, not only just offensively, but defensively as well to contain one of the most high-powered offenses that contain the likes of Dak Prescott, Ezekiel Elliott, Amari Cooper, and C.D. Lamb. That is going to be at the forefront once again in this matchup with the Packers going up against the 49ers. But to me, the element that's most at play here is the Packers and whether or not that they can rise above the pressure that's on their backs and really coming off of that loss from the Buccaneers game last year in the NFC Championship game. Now, as far as the game is concerned, I'm favoring the Packers in this one. I think they will be able to overcome the pressure this week and advance to the NFC Championship game. I think Aaron Rodgers has that offense firing on all cylinders. Now, this is despite the fact that the 49ers do have a very good pass rush and they have a pretty stout defense. The defense has been playing very good the last month or so. And it will definitely test Aaron Rodgers and that Packers offense. I do like the fact that they are getting Randall Cobb back in the lineup this week. They activated him off of IR. So I think he'll definitely be able to provide a spark for Green Bay's offense. I just think that overall, Green Bay's in a really good position here. And you combine the fact that I think their offense is going to play well. I think their defense is going to be able to force Jimmy G into some misplaced throws. I think they're going to be able to force possibly two turnovers off of him. And I think it's going to be easy sledding for the Packers in that regard, going up against Jimmy G and that 49ers offense. Really the main thing with the Packers defenses is that they have to limit Debo Samuel. Debo Samuel has been playing lights out pretty much the entire season. He showed it once again in that Cowboys matchup, but I do think that the Packers are going to be able to slow him down significantly. And that's why I think that the Packers defense is going to have easy sledding against that 49ers offense. Now, as far as the score is concerned, I have the Packers winning this one by 10 points. I just like the fact that they're playing at home. This is where they play extremely well throughout most of the year, despite the NFC Championship game last year. That's a side note. But I think they just play lights out from beginning to end. I think they get up early, and then I think they pretty much force the 49ers into a pretty predictable uh, look offensively. And I think that's where they'll be able to exploit that San Francisco offense to get some turnovers from them. So I, I've got them winning this game by 10 points. Like I said, as far as the score is concerned, I'm going to say they win this one by the score of 27 to 17. That's how I see this game playing out. Yeah, we're going to, we're going to see if, you know, Green Bay can break the mold and, you know, finally shed that narrative that they cannot perform in the postseason. And then we're going to see if the 49ers can return to glory and try to repeat the success that they had a few years back when they were in the Super Bowl uh, against Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs. So there's definitely a lot riding on both organizations, but pressure wise, Kyle and I definitely for sure see this leaning more towards Green Bay because I'm dead ass. Kyle, if Green Bay folds again, there is not a chance in it's hell over. that man comes back. And, and the worst part about it is reports have been saying that the relationship between the organization and Aaron Rodgers has been improving as the season has progressed. That all falls to shit like a deck of cards, bro. It's like one click of the fucking foundation. It's over. Yeah, to, to me, there's some interesting storylines that are going to come from this game, depending on what the result is. Like, Let's say hypothetically the Packers win. The Packers go to the NFC Championship game again, you know, possibly staves off, you know, a huge Aaron Rodgers decision going into this offseason, depending on how the rest of the Packers playoff path goes. But really, the, the interesting thing will be Jimmy G, because if the 49ers do lose that game against the Packers, will he be the starting quarterback for them going into next year? Or are they going to switch gears and feature Trey Lance? as a starting quarterback moving forward. I think that's going to be an interesting dynamic moving forward, depending on what happens in this game. And then if it's the opposite, if the 49ers win and the Packers lose, well, does Jimmy G just become the 49ers starting quarterback for the foreseeable future because he got this team back to the NFC Championship game once again? Or 
is it going to be something in the line of is Trey Lance still going to be the starting quarterback despite Jimmy G's success with that team? And then with the Packers, obviously the the main storyline that would come from a Packers loss in the divisional round would be is Aaron Rodgers going to stay or is he going to go? To me, I think if they lose this game, I think he's gone. I think he just he won't tolerate that. I think he'll look elsewhere to find success. I think that there's a very good advantageous situation going on in Pittsburgh because Pittsburgh has a quarterback spot that is opening up based on what we presume to be Big Ben's potential retirement coming within the next couple weeks, if not the next couple months or so. So I think that there's a situation where Aaron Rodgers could be looking elsewhere, potentially Pittsburgh, but there's a lot riding on this game between the 49ers and the Packers. There's going to be some futures that are going to change quite dramatically based on what's going to happen in this game. I think it's going to be a fantastic game, though. Big time. But with that said, we're going to transition into our next game of topic, and that is going to be the Los Angeles Rams going up against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Let's give a quick preview of this game. Let's focus on the Rams first. The Rams are coming off of a dominating performance against the Arizona Cardinals last week. I mean, the Rams defense made Kyler Murray look like a freaking college quarterback just because of how weak and inept and subpar Kyler's performance was against the Rams last week in the NFC wildcard round. And then to kick it over to Tampa, Tampa came off of a pretty dominating win over the Philadelphia Eagles. Tom Brady looked like he was in midseason form once again, just playing lights out football. Defensively, Tampa's defense came to play, pretty much holding the Eagles to a shutout except for the garbage time points that the Eagles were able to get late in that game. But really, this matchup is just two evenly matched teams and the Rams and the Buccaneers clashing once again. The Rams and the Buccaneers already played once this season. They played each other in Los Angeles where the Rams were victorious. So they get to run this game back once again in the playoffs. It should be a fun and compelling matchup, but we're going to focus on the quarterback matchup that is going to take place between Tom Brady and Matt Stafford. Matt Stafford has been playing lights out since he started his Rams tenure. And in similar fashion, Tom has been playing lights out as well since he started his tenure with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And both are looking to propel their teams to get to an NFC Championship appearance. So Kevin, to kick this one to you, which quarterback do you have more faith in for this Rams and Buccaneers game, Tom Brady or Matt Stafford? So when it comes to faith, strictly for the question, I'm going to say I have a lot more faith in Tom Brady. Why? Seven Super Bowl rings, greatest quarterback of all time. It's really not that difficult of a question. Now, do I think that they are going to win this game? I'm going to be bold. I'm going to go and make the prediction. The Rams will provide the upset. Here's why. I think that Matt Stafford has lost enough in his career. Tom Brady has won enough in his career, and it's about time for a fucking change. Uh, no, like, I'm totally kidding. But truthfully, Matt Stafford has had a terrible narrative playing in Detroit. They haven't won a playoff game over there. Obviously, he was in the playoffs about three times when he was down there in Detroit, all of them in losses. Uh, Odell Beckham is probably one of the top graded, if not the top graded wide receiver thus far in the postseason. postseason I know that we only played one game, but – for him to be performing the way that he did and then get a PED test, by the way, the day after they won, uh, a little bit questionable, questionable NFL. You guys are looking a little weird just because just someone has a good game doesn't mean that they're taking drugs. But anyway, uh, yeah, no, I'm actually going to take the Rams in this one. I think that Matt Stafford uh, has served his dues, has, has done what he's needed to do to kind of shake that narrative. I think that he finally has a great team assembled around him. I think he's got a great head coach. I think that Odell and Cooper Cup, Tyler Higby, Cam Akers had an incredible game last game. And then, of course, with them getting uh, Sony Michelle and a trade with the Patriots, I think that one-two punch in the backfield, along with probably the league's best offense, in my opinion, outside of maybe Buffalo or, or Dallas, uh, I think that they're going to give Tampa a run for their money. Tampa just has so many injuries right now. Obviously, God wins out. Um, obviously, Mike Evans is not 100%, although he did have a great game last week. He's still battling his injury. Leonard Fournette and Ronald Jones Jr. are still questionable. And from what Kyle and I read before we even started recording, it 
kind of, to me, is leaning towards they're not going to play just because they have not been activated off of injured reserve. They are not looking to be activated anytime soon. And obviously, you need to be activated a few hours, if not a couple of days, before game time to actually be eligible to play. And let's be honest, by the time this episode comes out, it's Friday. If they're not activated Friday, the game's on Sunday, I don't know if they're going to play at all because I think Bruce Arians, Kyle correct me if I'm wrong, Stated that if if uh, if Leonard's not 100, percent they're not going to force him to come back, right? Yeah, it's a wait and see situation with him. So Bruce Arians is taking the cautious side because he does believe that this team has a postseason, or should I say, another Super Bowl run in them. But um, if I had to, like I said, if I had to put money on it, if I had to actually make an assumption and a guess, I'm going to take the Rams in an upset, and I'm going to take the Rams by about three points or so. I think that it's going to be a really really close game. And uh, I think the Bucks Super Bowl repeat run ends on Sunday. Yeah, so I agree with the first part of your analysis. I, I would favor Tom Brady over Matt Stafford in regards to just having more faith in who's going to play better. And then when it comes to the overall matchup, I am going to favor the Buccaneers in this one over the Rams. And here's why. So... These teams already played each other once earlier this season. And despite the fact that the Rams did win the game, I thought that Tom Brady played exceptional in that matchup earlier in the season. If memory serves me correctly, the guy threw for over 400 yards in that performance against the Rams. And the Rams have one of a have one of the top-tier defenses in the NFL. That's despite the fact that they have guys like Jalen Ramsey, Von Miller, Aaron Donald. I mean, these dudes are beasts in their own respective positions. And despite the fact that Tom was going up against that type of defense, I thought he played extremely well. Were there some plays left out on the field against the Rams in that matchup? Absolutely. But overall, I thought he played a pretty solid day against the Rams. And I think going into this game, I think Tom remembers that game quite well. I think he knows that there were some plays that he left out on the field in that first matchup, and I think that they're going to be able to essentially claim some sort of redemption against the Rams in this matchup in the NFC Divisional Round. I think just Tom's playoff experience, it just looms so large in this game. He's been here before once again. I think, if I remember correctly, this is like his ninth straight divisional appearance in the playoffs, which is just absolutely ridiculous. That's another side story for another day. But just you can't deny just how valuable that playoff experience is. And especially with the Buccaneers and the amount of injuries that they've been dealing with as a unit. I think that he'll rise above the occasion and just provide Tampa with a huge performance against a really good Rams team. Now, as far as the game is concerned, I have the Buccaneers winning, like I said. I think it's going to be very similar to what you predicted. I just have the opposite result. I do think that this is going to be like a three or four point game when it's all said and done. I think the Rams, they're going to be in it the entire way. I think Matt Stafford is going to play lights out football because I do think that that Tampa defense is suspect. And with the amount of injuries that they've had on that side of the ball, I do think that Matt Stafford Odell Beckham Jr., Van Jefferson, these guys, and, and Cooper Cup. I can't forget Cooper Cup. God, God forbid I forget him. I think that they're going to be able to exploit some holes in that Tampa defense, and I think that they're going to be able to put up a decent amount of points in Tampa on the road. It's just that I think that Tom is going to be the difference maker in this game. I think he just plays lights out. I could see him throwing for three touchdowns, in this game, potentially somewhere around 300 to 350 yards passing. And I think they're going to get decent contributions from the run game. We'll see what happens with Leonard Fournette and Ronald Jones. I'm a little bit more optimistic in them playing. They're still kind of up in the air as far as their status goes into that game. But if they do play, I think they will be able to provide a pretty good spark for that Buccaneers offense. If not, you know, Giovanni Bernard and Keyshawn Vaughn are going to have to step up in a tremendous way. And they were able to last week against the Eagles, and I could see that continuing against the Rams in this matchup. I've got the Buccaneers winning this one by the score of, let's say, I'm going to say 31-27. to 27. This is going to be a very high-scoring affair. 
But it's like I said, I think Tom is going to be the difference maker in this game. And that's why I have more faith in Tom than I do Matt Stafford. And I think that's the reason why I think the Bucs are going to win this game and advance to the NFC Championship game. So it's weird because I'm looking at this game and I'm saying, damn, Tom has an opportunity for eight. Matt Stafford is trying to bring Sean McVay back to the big game to have Mm -hmm. another shot at, at, at competing for a championship. But if I'm looking at this objectively, there were a lot of instances in that Tampa game against Philly where Jalen Hurts made some pretty decent throws and there were some holes in that coverage. And I know you mentioned it just briefly where Tampa's secondary is the weakest part of their defense. We all know that they're more dominant in stopping the run run in their front seven. If Matt Stafford could get into that secondary and he can start dicing it up with Cooper Cup being the route expertise runner that he is, Van Jefferson to extend the field with the deep ball, and then, of course, Odell Beckham Jr. doing the combination of all, pretty much everything you can possibly think of with a wide receiver. And then the trickery of Sean McVay and then obviously Tyler Higby being over the middle in a safety blanket as a tight end. This game could get away quickly for Tampa if they don't rush the quarterback. Now, I know that they have been a pretty solid team at rushing the passer over the course of the season, but I think Sean McVay is going to be a little bit more prepared for that. I think that he is going to come ready to combat that pass rush. And I think that that's going to bode into my prediction because there's no way that Sean's not ready for for, for, for Shaquille Barrett, Vita Vea, and Indama and, and Kinsu and JPP. I just I don't see him going into this game saying, you know what, I have Matt Stafford, that's enough for me. Like You have to be able to protect your assets and you have to be able to come into this game ready to go. So I'm standing by my pick, man. I think that Tampa's weakest point being that secondary is going to be, like Shaq would say, barbecue chicken, man. I think that he is going to find holes in that defense and he is going to find a way to lead these, I was going to say St. Louis, the L.A. Rams into maybe defending a Super Bowl title in their home building. Maybe back-to-back years we go into that. Maybe a rams Bengals Super Bowl. I don't know. Yeah, I've... Bro, we're gonna have to dive in, uh, into that that Bengals prediction a little bit more on a different day. We're gonna we're gonna see that theory uh, play out this weekend. But we'll see. I, I said it though. I we'll said see. if they lost, I'm not gonna be shocked. I'm not gonna sit here and say it's gonna happen. I'm not gonna make a Colin Tower bold prediction. But it's just a gut feeling, man. I can't shake it. I've been saying it for weeks. I've been telling you personally. I just something about them. You know, I'll talk about Colin Cowherd in a second. But yeah, well, I don't know about Colin Coward in a second. I'm getting a little late here. <laughs> no, no I'm, just, I'm just saying. Um, you know, when it comes to this Rams and Bucks game, it's kind of funny because I th- I think both pass rushers are going to be extremely effective because when you look at Tampa's offensive line, they're hurt, and I do think that really the personnel that Tampa has, I think they they could be able to get a decent pass rush on Matt Stafford. So this could be a situation where I think both defenses and their front fours definitely make a huge impact. It's just that I think that Tom is going to be more effective to get the ball out earlier. I do think that Matt could be just as effective as well. It's just that the Rams have to go on the road. They have to go up against, you know, the Super Bowl champions in Tampa Bay. And even though they did beat the Bucs earlier this season, I think the Bucs remember that game quite well, and I do think that they're going to use that as redemption to get it back against the Rams, and I think they're going to be able to get this one in a very close matchup. So I think that really this is really one of the best games, if not arguably the best game of the weekend. You can maybe, maybe make a case for the Chiefs and the Bills. We'll talk about that game in just a minute or two from now. But overall... Just, I mean, the quarterback matchup, I mean, it's so evenly matched. I really think that this is the most evenly matched uh, game throughout the entire playoff slate this weekend. I, I don't know if you agree on that, but I, that's the way that I would I say see so. It. So, I mean, definitely get ready. I know that game takes place on Sunday afternoon or like around like three o'clock. So that'll definitely be a game uh, we look forward to with uh, great anticipation. But um, yeah, for sure. But um, with that said, we're going to transition into our last game of discussion for the NFL divisional round, and that is going to be the Buffalo Bills going up against the Kansas City Chiefs. The preview for this game is pretty simple. Um, 
This is a rematch of the AFC Championship game that took place last year between both teams. The Chiefs did beat the Bills last year in that AFC Championship game. They advanced to the Super Bowl where they lost to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in Tampa in Super Bowl 55. But as far as their playoff runs so far, granted they've only played one game respectively, the Buffalo Bills put an absolute beatdown on the New England Patriots at home, winning that game by the score of 47 to 17 one of the worst losses if not the worst playoff loss that the bill belichick led patriots have ever suffered and then to kick it over to the kansas city chiefs in a similar fashion they put an epic beat down on the pittsburgh steelers last week beating them by the score of 42 to 21 so both teams are coming in hot both teams are coming off of huge dominating wins in their respective matchups. And really, this is set up for a duel of the ages, except this is really the part two matchup based off of the matchup that they had last year in the AFC Championship game. So, Kevin, to get this one to you, to kind of focus on the Buffalo side of things, do you think the Bills can claim redemption from last year's AFC Championship loss against the Chiefs? Do you see that happening? I do. And again, another bold prediction. I got Buffalo winning this game, and this is going to be why. Josh Allen has a chip on his shoulder. We talked about earlier in the year after the Colts kind of embarrassed them and they went on that little bit of a skid that Buffalo could be washed. Buffalo could end up missing the playoffs. Buffalo ends up winning the AFC East. Buffalo gets into a good position in the postseason to where they are the fourth seed, right? Because Cincinnati is the third, yes. So... They go into that. We end up predicting that the Patriots are going to upset them because we think that Belichick is going to end up being more prepared, or should I say a little bit more equipped to face Josh Allen for a third time. And what did he do? He didn't just break the mold. He didn't just think outside the box. He ripped it apart, fucking spit it out, and said, yo, I'm here. I'm not losing again. And he didn't just have a game. He didn't just have a good game. And he didn't just have a great game. He had a nearly flawless game four total incompletions five touchdowns we went down the stat sheet last week but the point of the matter is the Patriots defense is not a scrub defense the Patriots defense is a top five defense all year Josh Allen is legitimately looking at this Chiefs team and saying we're not doing this again we're not going through this repeat again and I I believe them I think the coaching staff is great. I think the personnel is great. I think the quarterback is great. I think the defense is great. And I'm not saying that the Chiefs aren't. I'm just saying I feel I don't – again, I'm getting another one of those weird feelings in my gut that I'm just – I'm saying I got to lead with the Bills because I just feel – listen, when when Stephon Diggs waited on the field and watched the Chiefs celebrate as they were going to the Super Bowl, I felt that as a competitor, as an athlete myself, I just – that, that builds fuel, man. They have a, a, a motivating factor to say, I don't want to feel like this again. I know the Chiefs lost in the Super Bowl, so they have a little bit more of a motivating factor to get back to the game that they lost and were embarrassed in, quite frankly, against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And I'm not saying that the Chiefs aren't good. God knows Patrick Mahomes, that defense, and that personnel and that coaching staff are fucking amazing. But I just... I got to go with Josh Allen, man. They did not just beat a good football team. They beat the living shit out of the Patriots in Buffalo in a cold front, in a, in, in a, not a blizzard, but a fucking frigid ice battle that was taking place in Buffalo. And I really think, man, I really think, I know I'm sitting here and I'm looking at the damn weather. It's 38, so it's not going to be like Buffalo temperature. But the point is, this is going to be a battle. I know that Kyle said that the game prior with the Rams and the Buccaneers is probably going to be a very evenly and close matchup. Um, the Bills-Chiefs game might rival that because, I mean, you got two strong arms in Josh Allen and Pat Mahomes. you got two great coaches in McDermott and, of course, uh, Andy Reid. Of course, at that point, you give the edge to Andy Reid. But, you know, they have good run games, not consistent run games, uh, you know, with Edwards Alaire. Uh, Damian Williams, and then, of course, on the other side, Zach Moss and Devin Singletary. The receiving core of Buffalo, I would say, is probably a lot less than the receiving core out there in Kansas City because we know the weapons that they uh, they possess. But, yeah, man, I'm riding with the Bills. 
I think that the Bills are going to upset the Chiefs. I think the Bills are going to end up facing the Bengals in the AFC Championship. But this game will be a good one. I would probably say this comes down to three to six points. Yeah, I mean, this game is going to be fantastic. I really do think that it's set up to be an epic matchup. And really, it's just when you get a rematch from last year's AFC Championship game, it's the same stadium that they're playing in. And I imagine the Bills are just really just gnawing at the bit to get back on the field and claim some sort of redemption from last year's loss to the Chiefs. Except I don't think that they, they will get it. I got the Chiefs winning this one, and here's why. So when I look at Kansas City, Kansas City beat the brakes off the Steelers. I, Kevin, you and I both expected that to happen. Oh, basically, once that playoff schedule was set up, there was no way that the Chiefs were going to lose to the Steelers, and they beat them in convincing fashion and put up more points against the Steelers in that matchup than the first matchup that they had against the Steelers just about a month ago. So when I look at the Chiefs overall, they are playing at such a supreme level right now. They have shaken off those early season woes where they were very inconsistent. The offense was sputtering. The defense was playing up to snuff, but really once the offense got it together, the team as a unit, they've been playing phenomenal football once again. They've really ascended to the top of the AFC. I still see them as the best team in the AFC, despite holding the number two seed compared to the Titans being the number one seed. And I think when I look at this matchup, I think that the tight not the tight the Chiefs are gonna get redemption from the Bills for the first matchup that they had against each other in the early part of the season because the way that the Chiefs lost the Bills earlier in the season, I think it was quite shocking for a lot of NFL fans and a lot of diehard Chiefs fans because to lose to the Bills the way that they did at home, it was really just a gut punch for KC and it really tested this team moving forward. And I think that they've responded in the best way possible. I mean, they finished off they finished off with one of the best records in the AFC in the NFL as well. And I think just looking at the success that Patrick Mahomes has had in his relatively short career so far, it showed me that he was able to overcome those early season woes, get back on track, and really play just top flight football once again at that quarterback's position. And then to combine that, you know, you got guys like Tyree Kill. Travis Kelsey, they've been providing huge sparks for the offense. I do like the fact that they have Clyde Edwards Hilaire, Daryl Williams getting consistent touches between the two of them, providing huge impacts for them in certain respective moments in certain games. And even though that I think that Buffalo has been playing really good football of late, especially after that huge win over the Patriots last week, I think that the Bills season does come to an end. It's no slight against the Bills. I think the Bills are one of the most well-rounded teams in the NFL as far as their offense and their defense is concerned. I mean, their their defense is top tier, if not the best defense in the NFL. But you're growing up against a bad man in Patrick Mahomes, and that is no easy task going into this matchup. I think that the, the Bills, they're going to have a solid effort against the Chiefs, but I think the Chiefs are just going to be too much to handle. I think the Chiefs end up pulling away from this game at the end because I think it's going to be a close game early on and maybe through the third quarter. I just see the the Chiefs getting the edge in the fourth quarter, and that's where I think that they end up getting this game when it matters the most. So I got the Chiefs winning this one. I think it's going to be a one-possession game. I think it's going to be close, like I said. And as far as the score is concerned, I'm going to say the Chiefs win this one by the score of... Let's say 34 to 30. I think when it's all said and done, it's a one possession game, but I do think that the Chiefs come out on top and the Chiefs would advance to the AFC Championship game once again. And for the Bills, unfortunately, their season will come to an end. It's it's going to be a good one. Oh, it's, yeah. we, talk, we talked about this. I truly believe that this Mahomes and Allen matchup will be a consistent reoccurrence in the postseason. It could end up, I'm not going to say it's going to be to the same magnitude. So before you try to chop me up, 
I think this is going to be a reoccurring factor like a Brady and a Manning yeah. because of how young and how good these two quarterbacks are. I don't see any of them digressing to the point where they're not going to make the playoffs unless their teams completely collapse around them. But the front offices of both of these teams, the head coaching staff, they, they know what they're doing. I think that these two guys are going to get very, very familiar with one another and that this rivalry, which is what it's stemming to be, will be something consistent for the next five to ten years, possibly. Oh, I mean, I could see it playing out very similar to like a Brady and Manning situation just because, I mean, when you look at the AFC, really the NFL as a whole, I mean, these two guys are so exciting at the quarterback spot. You know, you got Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes, who play very similar styles, which is kind of ironic. It's just I think that Pat is a little bit more athletic, and I think that's really the difference maker that kind of sets him apart from Josh Allen slightly. Just because athletic, do you not see Josh Allen running the football the way that he does? Is that not athleticism? I just think that Patrick Mahomes, when he gets out into the pocket, he makes magic happen. I think that's really just the difference, though. Josh, I Allen, don't know if that's athleticism, though. I think that's a little bit more just quarterback, pure raw skill, like talent. But athleticism, I'm giving that to Josh. Josh is hurdling defensive ends, bro. It's just some of the throws that I've seen. Patrick Mahomes make I, I think it's just oh you mean the, the one where he was like flat on the surface in the Super Bowl to where he was able to yeah. fling it 30 yards yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm like bro like it, it takes athletic skill to be able to yeah do it that. does I'll, I'll give it to so, you yeah it does for me you know Josh Allen it, it, I think what's being highlighted with Josh Allen's athleticism is it's just they utilize him so heavily in their running game that's the difference maker. Yeah. And with Patrick Mahomes, it's not that. You know, he sits back in the pocket. He'll run around a little bit. Um, but just some of the throws that he he makes, they're just incredible. And, I mean, as far as, like, seeing them in the future, I, I, I see it 100%. I see them possibly meeting in the playoffs multiple times, not just, like, once or twice like within the next couple of years, I, I see this being a reoccurring matchup. Like you said, moving forward in the AFC, because these two have really kind of set themselves apart as the best quarterbacks in the AFC moving forward. As far as like the young guys go, these guys are top tier. These guys are playing at just such a high level. I would love to see these two just run it back constantly in the playoffs moving forward. I, I, I would love to see it. Yeah, but matchup for that ma- ma- matchup for future reoccurrences to get used to, but appreciate it while it happens because we've all seen NFL quarterbacks hit up, and then before you know, God forbid, something happens, team collapses. Like I said, front office changes. But again, not enough what ifs. Just a prediction on what we feel is coming in the future. We do have one final topic for you guys. We're going to change the pace from NFL. We're going to move it over to the NBA. Kyle. I believe you mentioned something about the defending MVP. So did. Um, let, 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 let's touch a little bit about uh, let's touch a little bit on that. All right, so we're talking a little bit about Nikola Jokic. Uh, Nikola Jokic has been playing phenomenal this season. I mean, the guy is coming off of a forty-nine point performance, fourteen rebound and ten assist, triple double, in a huge overtime thriller win over the Los Angeles Clippers. That matchup took place just a couple of nights ago. But really, when you look at Nikola Jokic this season, I mean, the the guy has been playing absolutely phenomenal so far. I mean, when you look at his stat line just from this year alone, the guy is averaging 26 points a game, almost 14 rebounds a game, and seven assists per game. The guy is just playing at an elite level. The guy is actually shooting at a higher field goal percentage than he was last year in that MVP season. And it really does beg the question of whether or not that Nikola Jokic is arguably the best player in the NBA at this current moment in time. So, Kevin, to kick this one to you, just with the way that Nikola Jokic has been playing this season, do you think that he is arguably the best player in the NBA right now? 
I think the argument is valid. I think that the argument needs to be noted and talked about a lot more than it is. Um, we all know that Kevin Durant, LeBron James, Giannis Antetokounmpo are all players that you would take over Nikola Jokic just because of the dynamic that they provide in multiple categories, both defensive, shot creation, separation, dominance in the paint, whatever you want to call it. But when you talk about a center, a genuine person that plays the five, not plays the four and the five, not plays the three, four, and five, not someone that can play multiple positions. We're talking a pure center in the NBA that is doing the things that he is doing at the consistency and clip that he is doing it. 26 a game, 14 boards, seven assists, shooting a consistency from the, from, from the field and a good jump shot from behind the arc. You have to start making a conversation that, He might be the best player in the league because he's doing it at a position that is unheard of. The last center that has dominated the league was Shaq. We all know that Dwight Howard was, it should have been a top 75 player of all time. We all know that Dwight Howard was a dominant player in and of itself, but Dwight wasn't able to shoot or pass or or, or handle the ball the way that Jokic did. Dwight wasn't able to impact the game and neither was Shaq, quite frankly. At, at bringing the ball up, finding your open man. I mean, Shaq had a couple of highlights where he was passing to the open person because he was fucking triple teamed. Like last night, for example, Jokic got his triple double, his 10th assist on a beautiful dime to Aaron Gordon in the corner. Now, whether or not that play was drawn up or not, the fact that they had enough confidence, like Mike Malone, is that the head coach's name yes. for Denver? Mike Malone had enough confidence to let Jokic make that pass. Not his point guard, not his shooting guard, not his small forward. His starting all-star defending MVP center made the game-winning assist to a power forward. Once again, let's just continue to keep this mindset. These big men are making these plays in the league, and I don't think they're getting enough credit for it. Nikola Jokic is 130% in the conversation because of the consistency and the dominance that he has been providing in the NBA for the last two seasons. He didn't win the NBA MVP by an accident. He's not in the runnings again by accident. I get it. When you're talking about game winner, two seconds left, got to give it to somebody. Yes, I'm not going to say Nikola Jokic is the guy I'm giving the ball to. No, I'm sorry. That doesn't mean he's not a valuable player. That doesn't mean he's not one of the better players in the league. That doesn't mean he's not the best player in the league because he doesn't play the position in which – he handles the ball at all times. Can he bring the ball up? Occasionally, yes. Can he make a flashy and, and, and beautiful pass like a point guard can? Yes. But can he play the five position better than everybody in the league outside of maybe Joel Embiid at a consistent pace? Yes. But he does everything you need an NBA player to do at this height. And by this, I mean like he's tall as shit. He's big as hell. He's not the fastest. He's not the flashiest and yet he's damn near averaging a triple-double as a center. I think that it needs to be talked about, and I think that Nikola Jokic has earned so much more respect than people are giving him right now. I mean, Kevin, I really couldn't agree with you more. I mean, when you look at Nikola Jokic's overall impact for Denver, I mean, they're the sixth seed in the Western Conference right now, and this is without Jamal Murray. And And Michael Porter Jr. I mean... You take Nikola Jokic away from this team, they'd be probably the worst team, not only in the Western Conference, they might be like the worst team throughout the entire NBA just because his impact is that great for Denver as a unit. So, I mean, when you look at where he is at this point in the season compared to last year as a whole, I mean, through 38 games, the guy is averaging 26 points. He is shooting... Almost 57% from the field, and he's shooting around 37% behind the three-point line. The guy is averaging damn near 14 rebounds a game, and he's averaging about 7.5 assists per game. I mean, these are right in line with what he had with his MVP numbers last year. In fact, he's been more of a presence on the defensive side of the ball with just, I mean, you're talking about almost four rebounds more per game which is absolutely ridiculous. Just when you look at Jokic, though, I think what Jokic lacks is just 
the flashiness that I think a lot of NBA fans have always grown accustomed to. I mean, when you look at guys in the past like Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, Kevin Durant, they've always had some sort of signature feature about their game. You know, Michael Jordan had the fadeaway. Kobe had probably one of the like the prettiest footwork that any player that has come through the NBA had. And then when you look at Kevin Durant, Kevin Durant, like his shot is just silky smooth. Or you look at guys like Steph Curry. You know, Steph Curry revolutionized the game with the three-point shot and the way that he played it. LeBron James, just the overall consistency that he's had throughout his entire career. Like, there's a key component about those players that makes them love those respective players. Jokic, though, is different because he's not the most athletic, but what he excels in is just his overall execution. And the way that he's able to play such a versatile way the game is played, you have to give him his credit where it's due. I mean, the guy won the MVP for a reason last year. The guy was just a king when it came to the analytical side of things. And once again, he's proving it again this season. And, you know, as the season goes on, you're going to hear about him possibly be in the running for the MVP again. I mean, to me, at, at this point, even though the Denver is not a top-tier team in the Western Conference as far as being like a one or two seed, the name Jokic needs to be in the MVP discussion moving on forward just because he's so versatile in that position at that five spot. Granted, he's different than Embiid, where Embiid is just a dominating force on the defensive end. He's great on the offensive side as well. It's just that Jokic, you know, he's from Serbia. He plays that position differently than Embiid does. But it's just, Jokic is just a king of being able to facilitate that ball better than really any center that I've ever seen play the game. And really, this is the evolution of the five spot in the NBA. And really, you see guys like Nikola Jokic leading that way leading the evolution of the center spot in the NBA. It really just is a beauty to behold. I know a lot of people kind of say about Steph Curry revolutionized the game with a three-point shot. Nikola Jokic, what he's doing for the center position in the NBA, I think has flown under the radar with just how effective he's been and just his overall execution. Granted, it hasn't resulted in winning an NBA title but it has resulted in winning an NBA MVP. And I think moving on forward, the guy is 26 years old. Jokic is going to be evolution is going to be a revolutionary force for that center position for the foreseeable future. And I think when it's all said and done, you're going to look back at new centers that are coming into the league and they're going to basically innovate some sort of style, but it's going to be based on what Jokic did. And I really think at this point, I think it's fair to say that Jokic is arguably the best player in the NBA. I wouldn't say that it's definitive that he's the best player in the NBA, but to me, I think it is well-deserved to throw out the possibility that he is arguably the greatest, not the greatest, the best player in the NBA. Guys, we're, we're definitely not trying to make the point that, you know, he is. We're, we're putting his name in the hat of the discussion that we continue to have every year, whether or not, whether it's KD, LeBron James, whatever kind of floats your boat. We just genuinely believe because of his impact to the game, we think that he needs to start being in that discussion. Mm-hmm. It took Giannis a while to get in that boat. It took KD a couple of years when he got into the lead to get into that boat. Obviously, you know, he was a little bit different being at the top of the draft. You know, him being at that tall, uh, that tall, lanky, skinny forward that was able to shoot, drive. It took him a couple of years. Kobe Bryant, uh, rest in peace, said it took Durant a while to really develop that arsenal. And, you know, like Kyle said, Jokic is still developing his arsenal. And I think that... uh you know, God, God only knows. I mean, 38 games this year, he's averaging those numbers. By the end of the season, it might be even better. It could be worse, but he needs to get a lot more respect than he's getting. And I know that he is mentioned on ESPN and Bleacher Report and all these different sites as, you know, the best center in the game or fighting with Joel Embiid for the best center. But 
I'm tired of just center. He needs to start being in that worldly conversation for best player. And whether or not he actually is, is completely dependent upon your opinion of how you view the game. But his name is for sure in the hat, in Kyle and I's opinion, and I think it's going to stay there for a while. Yeah, I, I think at this point, to me, with the way that he's started off this year, coming off of a great MVP season last year, I I, I mean, it, it is kind of crazy that we don't already have his name kind of like synonymous with essentially the top tier players in the league, like LeBron, Steph Curry, Kevin Durant. I mean, Giannis Antetokounmpo. I mean, to me, Jokic is already a top five player. Whether people see that or not, he's playing like it. The numbers reflect that. Granted, he hasn't won an NBA championship yet. I mean, the farthest that they've gotten to as a team was the Western Conference Finals uh, the year that they went into the bubble, and that was, I think, the year that um, the Lakers won. The, the Lakers finals. won. But when you look at just the path that he's been on, he has been progressively beginning better since his rookie season. It really kind of, I guess, led to the pinnacle last year as far as getting an MVP goes. But to me, just as a player, I think it kind of goes without saying that he deserves a lot more respect than what he's given. And I think really when you see the rest of the season plays out, I think he is going to take his play, which has already been phenomenal this year, and take it to another level. Because I imagine that Denver is trying to get a better result than what they had last year, which is getting bounced out by the Phoenix Suns in a sweep. So I really do think that Jokic is going to be that guy leading the way for Denver. But I think when it's all said and done, I think Jokic may be the most transformative player for that center position in NBA history. Granted, Shaq was the most dominating force that the NBA has ever seen, and he dominated that five spot during his tenure. But the way that Jokic is revolutionizing that spot, it could eclipse that. It could. That may be a little bit premature, maybe a little bit prisoner of the moment, but I've never seen a center shoot this well. I've never seen a center facilitate the way that he facilitates. Granted, he is not the most silky, he's not the silkiest player out in the court, but he makes it happen. And really, at the end of the day, if you make it happen, despite how it looks, isn't that what matters the most anyway? Just being able to execute? Yep. I mean, a guy's a beast. And the crazy thing is, he's my age. I think the guy's older nice. than me. The, the like, I think he's like, I think he's born in February. I was born in March. The fact that we're the same age, yet he's f- freaking 6'10", 6'11", dominating the NBA in the manner that he's doing. And I'm just sitting here in my chair talking about sports. Just kind of stark, right? It's actually kind of crazy when you make it seem like that, actually. But that's another topic for another day because it's 1230. Yeah, you ready to wrap this up, bro? I think, I think we finished yes. everything. Yeah, th- I think we covered everything, guys. As per usual, thank you so much for the support. Obviously, with the change in some of the things we've been making, we have been seeing an uptick in the channel in most of our statistical categories. So, uh, you know, big, big, big kudos and shout out again to Kyle, man. Changing the thumbnails, changing all the different things. Little things that you guys don't necessarily see behind the scenes. Um Kyle's putting in all the extra work. Kyle's doing a lot of different things to really kind of uh, make our channel just a little bit better each and every day. Um, And, you know, again, without Kyle, I could not do this. So as per usual, thank you to my partner, man. I really do appreciate it. And everything that we have achieved could not have been done without you. I appreciate that, bro. But I've only won half of the podcast. I'm only one half. I need a co-host to go along with me. And, dude, I mean... Provide great analysis every time we get on here. And um, I definitely appreciate, you know, the input that you provide. Not only just on, you know, when we're recording, but just, you know, off camera and just, you know, the things that, you know, we go through day in and day out. So I definitely, definitely appreciate what you're able to provide for the podcast, dude. I definitely appreciate that. 
little bits and pieces here and there. Guys, we are normally way more emotional and like animated and like energetic. But again, I, I know I continue to reiterate time between a couple of other things we were working out and, and then trying to get some of the thumbnails and titles and things that we're trying to reorganize. We started recording a little bit later than usual. This is probably the latest we've recorded in months. Yeah. So um, we do apologize for this one being a little bit lackluster in terms of energy, but we going to come hot, heavy, ready to go on Sunday. And the sucky part is, though, Sunday when we record, we will be recording during the Bills-Chiefs game. So we're going to have to monitor that game as it goes live. Yeah, that, Yeah. I, I think, did they start at 6.30? 8.15. That's a terrible time. That's you. It's the Sunday night game. It's what it always is. The AFC early. Championship and NFC Championships will be at like three yeah. and six. Yeah, but we'll figure yeah. it out. We always do. Yeah, that'll be that'll be an interesting one. But um, no, I, I mean we're set up for a great weekend. I hope you guys enjoy the games. Um, really, just once again, just thank you guys for supporting the podcast in the way that you have. Whether that was listening to us on the audio platforms like Spotify. And Apple Podcasts, definitely appreciate you guys. Um, if you guys watched our YouTube content, we definitely appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, if you guys want to support the channel in any way, shape, or form, hit that subscribe button or like one of our videos. We definitely appreciate the support wherever we can get it. Um, like Kevin said, we're going to be ready to go Sunday night. The episode will drop on Monday, so definitely get ready for that. Getting down to the nitty-gritty, Kevin, in the, uh, in the NFL. So that's what it's all about, and uh, we're going to be here for it. But... Other than that, you guys, I think that's pretty much all that we got from here. Once again, just thank you guys for tuning in, and we will see you guys next week.